Hello, hello, KubeCon, and welcome to the great kates.gcr.io vanity domain flip. My name is Stephen Augustus. I am a senior open source engineer at VMware. I'm also one of the SIG release co-chairs and a Kubernetes release manager. So we're uh, generally responsible for uh, maintaining all of the infrastructure as well as uh, pushing all of the Kubernetes that you consume day to day. And hello, my name is Linus Arver. I'm a software engineer at Google. Um, I am the main author of the Container Image Promoter, which we'll be getting into uh, more later today. And I also contribute to the working group for Kate's Infra. We do lots of different things. Um, the Image Promoter was probably one of the biggest uh, projects to happen recently in this group. So a quick overview of what we're going to be covering today. Uh, we're going to be talking about the historical context and the rationale for uh, image promotion and the vanity domain flip overall. Um, the infrastructure changes that are required. Uh, so walking you through how the container image promoter works as well as how it's tested. And then finally, some lessons that we learned along the way. So what is kates.gcr.io? Um, Kates.gcr.io is a vanity domain or a human friendly name that essentially points to a folder uh, within a Google uh, container registry, right? So in our case, in, uh, in the before times, we're looking at uh, gcr.io slash Google containers. And today we're uh, pointing to Kates uh, dash artifacts dash prod, right? So the, so why, why a vanity domain name, right? This allows us to uh, make infrastructural changes behind the scenes uh, with minimal and hopefully no downtime to uh, operations that depend on these images. Um, so that flip is something that hopefully you didn't notice. It happened in July. And, uh, and yeah, that's what we're gonna talk all about today. So here is a highly scientific uh, diagram of how we've done the container image flip. Uh, if you imagine uh, changing a, a DNS record, you kind of stand up the old thing, uh, you know, stand up the new thing and uh, slowly uh, move traffic away from the old thing. And you know, that culminated in essentially a flip of the backing of, of the backing registries for that, uh, that vanity domain name. But is that it? There were some infrastructure uh, improvements that we had to do that were absolutely not trivial. Um, but fortunately, that gave us an opportunity to improve the, uh, the way we do production images, the way we test these images, uh, improve the overall security posture of the project, um, including things like uh, essentially business continuity, right? Knowing that we, we can, um, we can create backups, we can recover uh, from those states, and we're able to audit all of the changes that are happening in that system. Uh, so Linus is going to uh, jump into more details on the, the historical context uh, from the Google side. Thanks, Stephen. So yeah, the entire process um, probably took um, around two years. So um, the initial idea of promoting images based on a configuration, um, internally at Google, while well, we were still in the old, still using the old um, Google containers folder, uh, that happened in 2018. Um, and then between 2018 and 2020, we uh, basically did like a rewrite of the internal promoter for the open source community. Um, it's basically the same idea, although it's um, implemented entirely differently. Um, there's also um, auditing and backups involved, which were separate infrastructural pieces. Um, and these changes um, basically led up to the change for the flip, which happened in July. So uh, why did Google need an internal promoter to begin with? Um, so Steven's kind of hinted at the, some of the reasons and it's basically to, uh, it was basically to make it more secure uh, for Google to promote these things. Basically, to give you a little backstory, um, at the beginning, before the internal promoter existed, we had roughly 60, 70 Googlers who had production access to, you know, modify, have right access to production. And that was considered a, you know, not a good security practice. 
So there was basically a mandate saying we need to lock this down to, you know, very few people. Meanwhile, we don't want to, you know, make these 60, 70 people uh, like unable to push images on their own. Uh, let's do something about it. So we created a internal uh, bot basically um, that does the pushing of images from staging to production uh, for the Googlers. So this also made it um, better in that there was less human error involved and also made the changes, you know, who pushed which image that auditable in the history, in the source code. So this is just basically uh, an illustration of what was happening, you know, circa 2018 before the internal promoter. So people were manually copying images from stage into production, that's Google containers at this time. And obviously, you know, this was not a great idea. Um, I won't spend too much time on this slide, but basically we need a change. And this is what we did internally. So we basically had a production, like uh, ac a bot that had production access. Um, it held the keys to production. So humans weren't allowed to um, individually change, make changes to production. And because of that, it made things more secure. Um, the, the history of the changes to production was uh, auditable because all the changes to production were done in source code. Uh, this is kind of like, you know, configuration as code, that concept. Um, and we also had pre-submit checks for any new changes going in into the promoter manifest, which is like the green box you see there in the illustration, um, just to guard against human error and to check that the images are okay and all this other good stuff. So fast forward like a year, and this is like, you know, late 2019, and basically we decided to do an open source version of the promoter, but, you know, we couldn't just, uh, you know, copy paste the code from, from Google's code base to, you know, GitHub to, to donate it. Um, because, I mean, we could have technically, but uh, it wouldn't have worked anyway because we needed performance um, guarantees that really weren't there because yeah, the scale is completely different. Um, if you recall the slide from earlier, basically it's an image copy, but for the internal like Google case, uh, we were talking about a handful, maybe a couple hundred images. Uh, but for the open source case, we're talking about like everything. And also we're, uh, the open source version tracks a lot more um, images, roughly 30,000 unique ones to be exact. Um, so, the manifest is like, you know, basically that much bigger. There's a lot more stakes that, um, or intent that is tracked. So to do that, we had to rewrite it and go. Um, it takes roughly 30 seconds or a little bit less than that to read all of these um, images from uh, GCR, which is a production repository, and to kind of reference that against the manifest to do the promotion. So that's pretty cool. Um, Golang makes that a little uh, bit easier because we can use concurrency. You know, it's, it's very easy to do there in that language. Um, I'll be also talking a little bit about the edge data structure, which we use for um, basically encapsulating the idea of promotions to make it a little bit more easier to reason about. Because when you're talking about ninety thousand like edges or promotion, basically uh, you do you need to simplify the problem a little bit to basically make debugging easier. So as for the performance optimization, um, these are the four steps basically. Um, so the promoter, when it first starts up, it reads in uh, images in the promoter manifest. That's the you know stuff checked into GitHub by a human uh, currently. Um, it just describes the intent of what we need to promote. That's the blue circle there. Um, it then reads all the Stuff already in production. That's the stuff that takes 90 or 30 seconds, roughly. Um, and then it does a delta. So it removes all the stuff that's already been promoted. That's what's in purple. And then we only promote what's left. That's the blue circle. Um, for the eagle-eyed uh, uh, people in the audience, the red stuff here, you know, you might ask, what, what's that? You know, what do we do there? Those are images that are not tracked yet, basically, in the manifest. Um, that used to be a pretty big chunk, but we actually added a what's called like a legacy or a backfill manifest to 
track all those as well. So in actuality, this red circle or this red part is pretty much non-existent today. So the edges, um, so this is like a pretty simple concept. Uh, basically, we treat each edge as like a timeless uh, encapsulation of an image copy. So the edge has three parts. Uh, we have the staging name, the production name, which are vertices, and then we have like a connection between the vertices. And that connection is populated by the data. Um, that's, it sounds pretty simple, but it, it does uh, make it easier to reason about. I'll give you an example. So let's say somebody wants to promote from staging to production for this particular image called Foo. Uh, you might notice that the staging name, um, staging slash Foo, is a little bit different than the production name, which that's production path to Foo. So it's, the destination uh, endpoints are slightly different. Uh, you might also notice that the tag 1.0 in production um, is not the same in staging. Um, this is kind of by design. Like we don't care about the staging tag because we only care about images by their content. And every image um, with uh, unique content are, well, every image has a digest and the digest is unique because it's a you know, secure hash. So, uh, it really doesn't matter what it's named in staging, as long as it, we can find the hash, the, the, the blob. So these are the cases that the edge helps promote, or the edge helps um, detect. So we check against overwrites, where overwrites means putting a different image into the same production name or endpoint. That's bad. That's the uh, first example on the bottom left there. Like we don't want to promote two different things to the same endpoint. Cause that, that's basically, you know, uh, a disaster, right? I mean, you don't want one totally different image to somehow magically replace another one. That would be really, really bad. So that's a definite no. Um, however, uh, we don't mind having uh, multiple copies of the same thing promoting to the same endpoint. So that's the uh, bottom right, if you have um, two different staging projects, let's say R and S, they both have the exact same image and they both want to promote to the same exact endpoint in production, that's fine. Um, in reality, we actually do call these out as well just to reduce the um, performance cost, although that is negligible, but um, it's strictly speaking, it's not a bad thing. And the middle uh, picture there is like the normal case where you know you have different images from different staging areas going into different promotion or production endpoints. So this is how it really works uh, as an overview. So it gets all the promoter manifests, then creates these edges. That's what actually happens. Um, well, after it reads, you know, all the data from production. So once we have these edges and we check for illegality, et cetera, that's like the simplification step where we go from 90,000 like edges possible, and then we just reduce it down to like a, just a handful, maybe the 10 or the 20 that we need to promote in one, one step, um, or in one, sorry, pull request from GitHub. And then we just actuate each promotion. That's also done in parallel as well, because why not? Um, there are also two other pieces um, that I, alluded to earlier, which is auditing and backups. I'll just cover those um, briefly. So for auditing, actually, this is an interesting slide. So there's a lot of different pieces involved here. Um, we use a lot of different cloud components. So the auditor's job, before, before I get into how it works, the point of the auditor is to detect any changes in production that happen outside of the normal um, promotion process. So you know, you can have a, a team of people using the promoter, like, you know, day to day, that's fine. But what if somebody has access to production and does something, you know, on their own? Could be, you know, an innocent mistake, could be a hacker, anything, any change that, you know, that happens in production, uh, we want to know about, right? So um, in this example here, uh, the auditor is designed to basically detect any change. So, um, the production uh, registry where all our images are stored, it's stored in GCP or GCR. Um, GCR has this 
feature where you can have any change uh, that happens in GCR, you know, get notified via PubSub. So anytime an image gets uh, pushed there, anytime it gets deleted, or anytime a tag is created, all of those things are individual events that um, PubSub basically generates if you listen to it. So that's what's happening in step one. So in this example, there's like a bad image. That's a red Docker image there. And then because the auditor is listening to PubSub, um, it, it spins up. And as soon as it spins up, uh, this is in Cloud Run, it pulls GitHub. So it says, OK, I got this these promoter manifests here. That's the official, you know, everything in the master branch. Um, does this Docker image that I see, does it match stuff in this you know, manifest? If not, then it alerts error reporting, which is another cloud component. Um, if it does match, then nothing happens. Um, the error reporting then gets fed into Slack. Um, there's a Slack channel for this, but you know, I didn't. I kind of ran out of room. I don't want to add in too many things into the slide. So, um, so that's how that works. Um, and for backups, uh, so we also have backups of production. This is pretty simple. We run it every 12 hours. There's a full copy of production um, in a production. Sorry, in a backup registry. Um, just, I guess there are a couple things uh, here to note. Um, uh, well, the, the main thing is that due to quota uh, constraints, so the initial implementation of the backup was actually uh, a bit naive. So we tried to do a full snapshot, uh, snapshot of all 30,000 images every time. And that basically uh, ate up all of the quota for GCR reads. Like the GCR API only allows you to read you know, a certain number of uh, or only allows, allows you to make a certain number of API calls per hour and like per day, there's different limits. So when we first did our version of this, uh, the backup job was eating up all of the quota. So we actually brought down like the proud jobs and stuff that was running. So sorry about that proud team. Um, but we've since fixed it. Um, we just do incremental backups today. Um, the I guess the other thing to note here is that uh, production only grows. We never delete images because deleting images in production would be a very bad thing because Kubernetes, as you know, is used worldwide. It's used everywhere. So you never know who is using which image at which time. So uh, by that reason, we always add. We never subtract or you know, change or modify. So that kind of makes the backups easy because you, know, you only get more stuff in production. It only grows. So Every time you do a snapshot, you really only need to snapshot new images, and that's about it. You don't need to think about deletions or changes to existing data. Like all of that is kind of unnecessary. So this is pretty simple. So that's the overview of the three, I guess, major pieces. And Stephen's going to talk about some of the tests that we do here. Yeah. So you know, I think you know the the natural next step is to to, to ask how do we test all of this, right? And uh, it's pretty simple, right? We, we, uh, we test it as you would test any Go program, standard unit tests. There is no extra sauce, uh, just kind of using the standard um, Go testing frameworks. Now, the, what's a little special about what we do, um, and maybe it's less special if you, if you like testing in prod, um, is there is a custom end-to-end uh, -end, uh, test framework, which is built around being able to replicate uh, the actions that we would do moving from staging to prod. Um, what becomes a little trickier about these systems is that um, when you're operating with a system whose idea is to handle promotion um, from a essentially non-prod bucket to a prod bucket, uh, what you have to consider is we have to test against uh, endpoints that would look very similarly to, to prod have the same sort of restrictions that we would place on a prod uh, 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 registry. So our testing happens in kind of a near prod environment um, where there is there are uh, GCR endpoints set up, uh, pub sub, cloud run, error reporting, everything that Linus mentioned before, as well as a fully replicated backup stack. Um, and here we're going to see a pretty diagram of uh, what that looks like. So again, very, very similar 
to what we saw on the previous slides around and uh, around end to end testing instead, right? So that promoter, uh, you know, that promoter is in play. There's a staging and a near prod uh, bucket as well as verifications against GitHub. Uh, cloud cloud run and error reporting to handle the auditing pieces as well as that production backup component or that near prod uh, backup component. Uh, so I'll talk actually about the actual flip. So uh, we just talked about the infrastructure, you know, all the different pieces that were necessary to make this happen, to make it more robust, more secure, all this good stuff. Um, but what about the actual flip, the change for that? You know, it's a DNS change, basically. Um, it wasn't rocket science, but um, that has kind of its own history. So I'll kind of go briefly over what actually happened. So the very first attempt happened on April 1st. Uh, no joke. Uh, <laughs> but un unfortunately, this was rolled back. Uh, it was on a Friday. So it was a typical, like, you know, it was a nice Friday afternoon. We started on Monday and then April 1st. You know, and then Friday, it's like, oh God, you know, what is this weird signal that I see? And <laughs> basically, we have to roll it back. Uh, long story short, there was a hardware, uh, sorry, hard coded configuration uh, in our code base. Um, it basically resulted in a, 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 you know, an incident. That's that's where I'll leave it. <laughs> um, but the good news is that. Uh, because of that incident, uh, we had a lot more eyes on this whole project. So we had a lot more people come in uh, just from the Google side. And also maybe, yeah, I think we had more people interested in it after this like attempt happened that we had, had to you know, undo it. So more people in the community were like, hey, what's wrong? You know, anything you can do to help. So that was a cool uh, little, uh, cool, cool, <laughs> cool event. As well, I call it. And then the second event happened, or attempt, sorry, happened in June. Uh, unfortunately, it's like we're kind of you know cursed or something, right? Because reasons. So this was a purely non-technical issue. So basically, if you recall, the new production uh, backing store is a different name. Well, it's called KSR Backed Prod. It's in a different project. Different project means it's built differently. Basically, a different credit card. <laughs> so uh, the issue here really is we kind of forgot, you know, the lightness of the change. The domain flip is a very simple, like you know, pointer flip. Like that's very easy. But what we did, we kind of forgot, was that that little pointer uh, points millions and millions of API requests like every day. It's something on the order of like hundreds of billions like per week or something like that. It's huge, it's a huge amount of traffic. So what we realized at the last moment there was, you know, hey, if we flip this, can the new project, can that, you know, new, you know, owner or whatever, you know, the community basically, can they pay for it? And if they don't have a, you know, credits or something set up already beforehand to take all this traffic, you know, what if we automatically shut it down or something? Because that's how, you know, GCP works or something. You know, that's how most cloud providers, I imagine it would work, right? If you use uh, Amazon and you just spin up, you know, 30,000 VMs or EC2s, you know, and you don't have the money to pay for it, I'm sure they'll shut you down. But So in order to avoid that scenario, we just kind of, I think we rolled it back immediately. I think we spent a few hours on day one. It's actually a four-day rollout. So anyway, yeah, uh, we kind of realized this a few hours in and just, you know, preemptively, undid it. There was no uh, issue there in terms of like technical, like we didn't hear about any um, issues. And the third attempt finally happened on July the 24th. Or uh, I think it wrapped up on the 24th, because I think that was a Friday. Um, but yeah, it took four days. Um, it's a four day rollout, so we had to wait. But uh, I think, yeah, true to our intentions at the beginning, uh, no systems noticed this. So it was a nice, like, you know, under the radar chain. That's how it's supposed to work. That's what the vanity domain name is for. Um, so that was a nice moment when we finally realized that it did work, you know, on the third attempt. So, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so again, with a summary uh, of a 
incredibly simple process, wouldn't you say, Linus? Uh, from moving <laughs> from uh, one registry to another. Um, but it again begs the question, is that it? And no, it's, it's not, it's not. So for us to be successful in this endeavor, uh, lots of work had to happen in the community kind of adjacent to uh, the build out of the um, container image promoter. Uh, so some of that work in included developing tooling for staging projects, right? Staging projects are fundamentally a uh, newer concept in the community, right? Um, given, given, the, uh, given the background that Linus has is, is, uh, told you about, um, the pushing uh, artifacts to uh, pushing artifacts to Google containers kind of involved finding the right person who had access uh, to do it at any point in time. The release process is a little different um, because the release process has the keys that it needs to write into the uh, Google containers registry. Um, but for everyone else, for every repo across the multiple uh, Kubernetes, Kubernetes SIGs, Kubernetes client, so on and so forth, all of these orgs need a way of being able to produce images and uh, and have those promoted within um, within GitHub and within uh, GCR, right? So uh, to to our our trusty friend Bash, I think you know some a lot of clever Bash was written uh, to enable uh, us to generate uh, generate new staging projects as well as delegate uh, IAM to various uh, component leads to the the various owners of code, um, SIG, SIG uh, chairs and technical leads, as well as some project owners uh, to have that to grant them access uh, to write to these staging projects uh, or to wire automation to write to these staging projects. Um, so the second component of that is, well, now that I have access to push to one of these projects, how can I do it in a safe way? How can I ensure that what I'm doing is, um, is not looking backwards, is not doing something similar to, to what would have happened prior to the image promoter existing, right? And the way we solve that problem is a combination of Prow, a combination uh, of, of Prow, and uh, which is the Kubernetes and, and several uh, other projects in the ecosystems, uh, CI CD solution. Um, as well as uh, Google Cloud Build, right? So Google Cloud Build and a cloudbuild.yaml file in your repo is a common way to, uh, maybe that's hooked into a make target or a bash script that you've written um, that essentially tells us or tells, uh, tells GCB how to build your image and how to push it to your, our, your staging repository. What we get out of this uh, is an opportunity to, uh, again, be able to audit some of these changes that are happening, right? These changes are no longer happening on a developer's laptop. They're happening as a result of a PR being approved and merged within a component area and subsequently a proud job kicking off a post submit after that PR has merged, uh, which kicks off a GCB uh, or Google Cloud build job that eventually pushes this image, right? Finally, you bring the human into the process and you have uh, you have them generate a, a manifest uh, for promotion or an update to a manifest for promotion. Um, lots of bash script cleanup. Uh, bash is pretty popular and our release process runs on about 5,000 lines of, of bash, which is kind of changing every day. Uh, so in addition to that, we had to make sure that uh, the components that we had already built out uh, were uh, able to support pushing into a new registry. Again, lots of hard-coded references to consider. So uh, maybe a few quarters of work and testing across, uh, across the release engineering subproject to, to uh, wire some of that stuff up. So what's next, right? Um, lots of exciting uh, discussion around tooling and how we, how we get all of this done. Um, it's, it's always good to look into the future, get a, a, an idea of what we want to accomplish next with this tool, right? And I think ultimately um, we want consolidation, right? We have, we have a Promobot tool that was also written for file 
promotion, right? So very similar concept. You'll see some of the um, some of the same concepts happening within file promotion uh, that happen on the image promotion side, and they're similar enough that they should be consolidated, right? So we are we have started work on uh, building one tool to rule them all for uh, promotion uh, for file and image promotion. We're working on deduplicating the release engineering libraries. So lots of great work has happened on the image promotion side, on the file promotion side, and as well as the kind of elimination of uh, bash scripts to run the release engineering process. So bringing all of that knowledge together in uh, common libraries for all of us to reuse. Uh, now, Google has recently announced the artifact registry, which is going to be the next generation of the Google Container Registry. Uh, so we need to make sure that the tools that we use uh, support any new APIs and, and that we're present around any potential uh, deprecation cycles that we need to consider, right? We wanna make sure that when, if we need to do this again, we do it in a safe way, we do it in a way that minimizes downtime for the community and for the consumers. Um, and then image, uh, image vulnerability scanning coming soon. We have active work on that. And finally, uh, you know, finding, finding people who are interested in this kind of work and, uh, and, and, you know, welcoming them into the community uh, to do release engineering work, to do work around this, uh, these uh, promotion tools that we've built out over the last few years. Uh, so I'll talk a little bit about the lessons learned here. So, you know, it's a big project. Uh, what did we learn? So Basically, infrastructural changes uh, for legacy code. I mean, I'm, I don't call, I don't think the existing, you know, release engineering bash scripts and whatever that's legacy code. Well, it works, but uh, tweaking just a small bit of that, you know, as Stephen said, just little references and stuff, that takes time because you have to coordinate all this stuff to get it right. Um, so that was really hard, but the rewards I think are worth it because it's so much simpler now. Um, anybody who has an interest in contributing new images and stuff, they can just come in and make a PR, get a staging sub project, and get their images in production. It's pretty straightforward. Um, uh, I will also repeat a quote from Tim Hawken, our principal engineer uh, for Kubernetes at Google. Um, he said to me, uh, as I was writing some of this stuff, if it is not tested, it is broken. Uh, you can actually find that in a GitHub like uh, discussion comment somewhere. Um, so yeah, that was, really eye-opening when he said that, you know, and really uh, all of the tests that we have today, they really help uh, bring some sanity into this uh, kind of chaos of, you know, all these images flying around everywhere, basically every day. Um, and also it takes a village because, you know, none of this happened uh, from just one person's efforts. It was the community, it was other Googlers, it was behind the scenes, uh, Google security helping out. Um, all of these people, like SREs, GK developers, there are so many people that I, I should actually name here, but I didn't have the time to add them to the slides. But yeah, it really does take a village. Sorry for all the people I didn't name. I'm going to forget your name, so I'm not going to try. <laughs> we'll mention them in Q&A, right? We can talk about that on, on Slack with you all later. Uh, so how, you know, to, to wrap, we wanted to, you know, just give you an idea of how to get involved. Right. So again, the container image promoter and the, the other artifact promotion tools are tools that are maintained uh, both by SIG releases, release engineering project, uh, release engineering sub project, as well as the uh, working group Kate's Infra. Right. So the promotion tooling can be found uh, Kubernetes SIG, uh, container image promoter. Some of that tooling has already started to be migrated into uh, uh, affectionately called K-release. So that's Git kates.io slash release. And then there are some of the, the links in how to contact us, right? So the uh, SIG release, uh, the working group Kate's infra, the SIG release repo, as well as where you can find all of the promo promoter manifests that we've been talking about today. So thank you again for uh, taking the time to hang out with us uh, at KubeCon. Uh, it has been, it's always a thrilling journey uh, and it's been really exciting to work on this project with all of the community. <laughs>